trash where you have this really uh, portfolio places. And one, one question is about the ministry place, you know. We published in DCRS 25 years ago, you know, a matrix calculation formula which we define the safe factor for intraocular lenses. And the safe factor was depending on the shape of the cornea and the axial length. And that made a, 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 a display of different shapes for different types of lenses depending on, the, on, on these two parameters. And for us, the, the ideal uh, eye for this type of lens was a myopic eye. And my question to you, I don't know if you have detected this paper published uh, by us some, some years ago, whether this safe factor has, it's a Q factor, you know, if you understand as well, how this is influential in other type of eyes, like for instance, standardized, uh, endotropic eyes, as far as our the safe factor seems to be for us only ideal for myos. This was it's a, of, theoretical optics question. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Jorge, for for the question and 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 yeah, you are you are uh, you are right, uh, and this is something we have in we have in mind. First, probably your calculation and your idea that the safe factor was uh, this particular safe factor for the meniscus was better for myopic eyes was based only at the time in on-axis calculations, and uh, our main issue here is that we had been trying to optimize, we forget about on axis, uh, and then we basically concentrate in the, in the peripheral part of the retina. But in any case, uh, we, know, we know that uh, there is a lot of studies, especially in, in myopia development in children, that uh, peripheral retina is depending, is different depending on the central refractive state. So we know that it's we can even do a little bit better. We can refine the particular shape to adapt to the central refraction of the patient. So it can be uh, a little bit fine-tuned differently for myops or for hyperops. So, so your point is, is very good, and this is uh, something that, that can be considered even to improve the, the design. Although what we get here, the, this particular meniscus shape, we try to get like the optimum features for one lens fits all peripheral shapes, let's say, right? But can be also the same that we are doing on axis for spherical aberration, we customize. You can do customization when you measure in advance a peripheral shape or peripheral refraction. So that's, that's a very good point for further uh, improvements in, in the future. Maybe I just add something. I think that it would be nice in the next presentation that you will do about this study, just to see how much is the balance between a, a image quality distortion, which is what analyzes the, 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 this uh, factor set that we calculated with the peripheral vision, because it should be a balance, you know, between, between the visual axis and the peripheral as well. This is something that nobody has explored ever, and you have this Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Could you go to the microphone? Thank you very much for good presentation and very interesting concept of the lens. But Dr. Andre from Ukraine, I have a very practical question. Do, did any of you face the uh, case of negative dysphotopsia with the patients with these lenses? Because it, it is not very frequent, but it's very disturbing when it happens. And uh, one of the theory why it happens is that the lens is further uh, from the uh, iris and we, we treat this, I, I face several cases of this negative dysphotopsia and the treatment was just to uh, move the optic out of the rexus closer to, to the iris. So for, from the lens I understood that your lens is deeper in the eye so you have deeper anterior chamber. Did you ever seen any, any type of problems? Okay, so I have, to be, I have to be embarrassed again. I only did four eyes, huh? <laughs> four patients. So, so I, I can't comment on negative dysphotopsia uh, for, because you, know, you need a large series. And I'm, I'm sure you can say more about that. I would expect there to be actually less negative dysphotopsia, if anything, because uh, if you look at, if, I don't know whether you saw the, the OCTs I showed, if you look at the periphery of the lens, it's actually in a normal position as with a standard IOL, but the meniscus shape, obviously in the center, it's a little further back. So I would actually, if anything, expect less. 
but I can't obviously comment because my series is much too small at this point. I don't know if Pedro or Jose Maria want to say something about this, but we are, in my opinion, there's, I have no experience with that problem with these lenses. No. But Pablo, do you also, would you want, want to comment on that? You know, the, the, the idea of, of, of negative dysphotopsia was always that there are rays of light which go peripheral to, anterior to the optic, and then obviously there's rays which go through the optic and are diverted or, or reflected, and then there's the rays which go to the peripheral retina, and then that gives you this dark you know, arc. Um, which, which the patients yeah. are often disturbed by. Yeah, I, absolutely. To be honest, we, all these, uh, these photopsia phenomena uh, usually appear to a much larger eccentricity. So we, we try to improve optics quality in what we could say mid-periphery, right? So we were not initially concerned about the very far periphery. But I think it's like an extra bonus. I think the, the particular shape of the lens is also uh, making a, a good effect to reduce the effect of these, uh, uh, these photopsia, that they are not very common, but as you said, in many patients, it's really very bad. So I, we, don't, we don't have a proof, but our feeling is that these lenses are doing a better job to prevent uh, these peripheral dysphotopsias. Although, to be completely honest, we were not thinking on that in the design phase, hmm? but it's like an extra, extra thing. Yeah, and then and I also have to, you know, I absolutely negative photopsia is a real problem, um, and, and and absolutely, you know, we have many patients who actually report it even on the first or second day, but it goes away in most. And then, as you know, with also the many of the symptomatic patients, after six, nine, even twelve months, it often goes away, or they get used to it and they're not irritated. But there are some where we have to do something, like you said, anterior buttonholing or putting a sulcus lens in. You know, we've done all kinds of things. Additional add-on lenses, all very, um, very cumbersome and, and, and very troubling. And I, I would believe with this lens, just from my very small optics knowledge, if anything, I would expect less. Ines, one question. And did you uh, customize um, the kind of art lens that you were using in post-refractive surgery eyes. So did you decide, depending on the Q value or the sphericity value, residual value, if you were going to use the 40 or the 75 or the 70 or the 25? No, I think the the I think that we have a few cases included in the results I've shown you uh, because we exclude all the post LASIK patients in okay. this group. But uh, I think they choose. Uh, I, I I didn't do the surgeries in that particular cases, but I think they choose uh, like there are three four myopes that were uh, high myopes that were uh, that went under uh, refractive surgery and they were directly implanted uh, with the RTL seventy. I think they they didn't choose the lens because of the aberration. I don't think so. I'm not sure. No. Did you? No, Jose Maria. So you select the 70 in those cases. Okay, which but is you, but you which could. is which is quite good if if it, it, this has been well accepted because if you have a relatively flat cornea because it was a high myopic LASIK, and they are accepting a a high aspericity, although conceptually this is compensating the positive mm -hmm. of the cornea, but I would have uh, expected to have. Uh, interference, optical interference, but if it works, this is a good sign. Uh, I think first point, you can do it. You can usually fine tune to the particular uh, value of the of the coronal aspericity. Uh, I believe they choose just the 70 because they, in, in these cases, with, without doing that. And uh, my feeling is in the few cases with, uh, with the 70 was really very good. Very mm -hmm. good result. That's good. So, uh, Jose, I, I have here. I don't know if there is more question, but I, I, I have here the several questions from the from the audience, in, uh, and actually most most of them are for uh, already 
uh, about the dysphotopsia, and there has been already covered. There is one about the size of corneal incision. To, I think uh, I've said 2.2, uh, it's a conventional 2 .2. incision. And yeah. another for uh, Dr. Findel is, has the impact of peripheral astigmatism on the mobility also been examined with models that are less influenced by vertex distance, for instance, contact lenses? Well, I think the study I showed, no. That was, yeah. that was with, with the vertex distance with glasses. Um, I think that the study which, is, which, which really needs to be done is, is, is obviously with this lens and comparing it to a standard lens. Yeah, you know? I, I agree. That is in... And again, another, another question for uh, these photopsias that we already that we already cover. So I think this is from the from the, the virtual uh, one. Roll, so. I mean, I, I have a question for you. I mean, because um, so let, because you spoke about macular disease as well. You had it on on your slides, and, and it makes sense that if you have somebody with macular disease, early macular disease, or even you know more pronounced AMD. Uh, um, that, that you try to improve the, the visual field because that could help them, um, you know, not only navigate, but theoretically maybe even, um, uh, even in, in, the, in the sort of, let me say, close navigation. Um, would you use a 25, meaning, you know, uh, make, it, make it otherwise as optically, you know, high quality as possible, or would you go for a, for a higher lens? I mean, I, in, intuitively, I would say go for a 25 and try to optimize the peripheral image as much as you can. Yeah, good question. With good question, and yeah, that should be the first. 25 could be uh, the first choice. Although, you know, we realize that the 40, for any reason, is so good for everybody that it's probably also okay going with the 40 for these for these patients. And uh, again, you can customize. You can really do more measurement and do more customization. But 25 would be first option. Maybe 40 will be working as well. Or as good, uh, also. No more questions. I encourage to try them. I am. So as you know, I I I I will start. Uh, well, I have already started, but I, I the same. I have. I have less patience than, than Oliver, so I thought it was going to be too ashamed my my presentation. So, but 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 conceptually, I think uh, you, you know that we have been working with ACE for ECTs for many years with different platforms, as you sh nicely shown in the beginning, with the with uh, and possibly the most experienced surgeons using or playing with with ACE for ECTs is, is, is Jose Maria, and I think is the is the is 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 the right way to go. Uh, anyway, I think I think this kind of combination, and if at the same time we can improve peripheral vision, uh, I, th I think that this is a very interesting field to to be to be introduced. I I, I, I just wanted to ask because you know the, the 25, 40, 55, uh, 70, you know, to, to put that into into perspective. So, uh, Pablo, would you say that the 25 is like uh, what we now call enhanced monofocal or monofocal plus, it's sometimes called? You know, there's a lot of lenses from different companies, you know, just a little more, not eat off yet, but a little more a strong monofocal with obviously the visual field. We've discussed it. That. That's actually the main aspect. But let's say, let's just talk about uh, the depth of field uh, aspect. And then, and then, and then the 40 and 55 are sort of the eat-off range, and 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 then the 70 is is like a, already like a, a multifocal, even though it's obviously would be not really refract, well, would be refractive, but not diffractive. What, what how would you, have, yeah, you know, just to well, put things into perspective so people this can? This is a, this is a very good question, and I I like to include the whole family actually in. A, uh, EDOF type of lenses, but of course, EDOF, what it means, EDOF. It's just, and the uh, 25 is like a very mild EDOF. 40 should be like uh, many, similar to many of what people call EDOF. <laughs> and uh, 55 and 70 is like uh, the strong guys in the, in, the, in the family. So they are a strong, a strong EDOF, right? In, and the, the reality is that uh, 20, uh, the 70 version, is really competing very well with uh, 
uh, those people wanted to have real uh, near vision without uh, reading glasses, right? So then you, in, you can compete with, the, with these uh, diffractive trifocals somehow when you combine binocularly. So yeah, exactly, exactly that, that point. So we cover, so the, the idea with the four models is just basically to cover this. And uh, we, and, and Ines mentioned this very nicely, that there is all these opportunities to combine binocularly. And then you can do it or you cannot, but then there is a lot of uh, extra play on that. But, 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 so, but Ines, did, did you combine it also with, uh, with some myopia, so some micro monovision, or did you just go for emetropia in both eyes? Uh, I think the lens work better with slight myopia. The, the combination of myopia and the negative spherical aberration works much, much better in intermediate and near vision, but mm -hmm. they can, you have good results as well in emetropia, so. Yeah, it's very small. It's, it's really very small. You target for emetropia, there is a small myopic seek, and there is something also, well, everybody knows, right? Be, because we are using negative spherical aberration. This is, what happened is that when people are looking near, especially with uh, bright light, pupil get smaller, and then you get naturally a myopic shift in your good direction. So it's helping in addition when you have a smaller pupil. So everything combined, you don't really need to have a, a very significant myopic shift. Mm -hmm. A little bit may help, but it's, it's, it's like a, if some people are not comfortable with monovision, well, we don't call monovision. <laughs> yeah, call whatever, it's, but it's a really a, a very nice uh, binocular approach that is uh, like a, a spheric binocular near vision correction or, or whatever. Now, I'll, I'll ask you one more question just from a safety aspect. I mean, I haven't seen it in my cases, and I believe you also haven't seen it, and I wouldn't expect it. Decentration tilt, you know, sometimes we get decentration tilts. It's very rare with these kind of modern IOL designs with, you know, hydrophobic acrylic haptics. But what, 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 what do you think is the sensitivity to decentration and tilt with this lens? Again, a good question. We don't have a lot of measurement on that. We could do it, we could have it, but we don't have it. So for the uh, 25 and 40, I think it's very, very tolerant also to decentration, right? 70 can be a little it, bit it of a It shouldn't have of an much issue. effect at decentration because of the optic is not it's not just a small area in the center of the optic like other EDOF lenses, so it, it shouldn't have ma much effect, I think. But Pablo, you can simulate that at the lab, no? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So but it's it, also it, depending it, on, the, on the particular corneal, corneal aspherosity. Of course. For it, it's, it's patient, but, but it's, uh, uh, I think we, it's, it's kind of very nicely tolerant also. We, okay. we actually, in all, all these cases, we cannot, well, I don't remember any, any uh, case that we have a, a very large disintegration. And the other thing is, that as, you, as you nicely shown us in a couple of publications uh, that you uh, did years ago, there is a limit in the, in the ace, fetish, ace felicity adjustment trying to improve depth of focus that is not risky for diminishing quality of vision, so you cannot play as much as you wish. So my question is that, have you had in any of the 70 cases, uh, so are you taking into account the pre-op corneal sphericity before you decide to use a 70? Or would you recommend that? Or do you think that that, that doesn't <laughs> well, matter? This is a good question. And, I, and I, well, com to be completely honest, you know, we had been promoting to, the, to do uh, adaptive optics in advance. Uh, and I think this would be beautiful just to customize using the, mm -hmm. our devices. The reality is that it's, it's, it's a kind of, we think that we can really uh, promote these lenses without the need of another instrument. That's a, and that's the reason we are doing all this. Uh, they have in the clinic the adaptive optics simulator, but they are not really using pre-op because I, we wanted to be sure that we can do this very good without another instrument. If you have this instrument and you want to customize, everything is going to be even better. But, it's, but we, we have not been using it. You can do it. But the, the response is that then you are not afraid of having 
yeah. independently of the corneal sphericity of this particular individual, any problem with the 70, which is you're increasing the negative quite significant. So I, I think if you have a patient... Well, uh, we, were, we always are conservative, so we were afraid. Uh, we are less afraid because we are seeing a very good result, okay. let's say, and then we can do the customization. I have an, a completely different point, and that is, you know, the meniscus shape. Oh, there's always the theory that you get a posterior vitreous detachment after cataract surgery because there is this loss of perturbance, you know, of the actual convexity of the crystalline lens when you have an IOL on the back. Now, obviously, we still have a loss of posterior curvature because the IOL is much thinner and is more anterior. But it would be interesting to see, and that's going to be very difficult to assess, of course, because you'd have to do a prospective randomized control trial to see whether you get, uh, whether you get less posterior vitreous detachments and or you know, peripheral breaks in these eyes, especially in the myopic eyes, um, because of, of that meniscus shape. Um, I, I know there was a theory uh, by, by, by Stuart Cumming for a long time ago that the, the plate haptic lenses, which also tend to, to, to they were quite thick, and also had, you know, sometimes pressed against the posterior capsule, that there was, more, was less retinal detachments. And there's a publication, I think, 25 years ago, where he showed a, a big case series. So I think that's a, an interesting side effect, which which maybe which maybe um, uh, may happen: less breaks, less retinal detachments. Well, this is a good point, and we were always hoping that there is a, a lot of clever points that we never thought it in advance, and there is like. A, some additional benefits. So this is something that uh, we are really very open to, to get this lens used and, and people doing studies and comparing. We are completely open in the property. So we are really completely transparent in what it is. So I think we can finish. I think that we have responded to all those questions that came virtually and, and directly. I really thank well, first of all, you, because of, have prepared a very nice presentations, and you all who remain here for the full session. Thanks very much.